<clears throat> we are in an interesting passage here. The title tonight is called Determined to Have a Christian Home. <clears throat> what makes a home Christian? Many who claim to be a Christian, which is simply being Christ-like or a Christ follower, do not have a Christian home. Going to church faithfully does not guarantee having a Christian home. Being saved does not guarantee you having a Christian home. So we're going to look tonight in Colossians chapter 3 in uh, verse 15 through 21 where that's what we're going to read and we're going to see some uh, directives here on what describes a Christian home then you can determine whether or not you have a Christian home or not in verse 15 it says and let the peace of God rule in your hearts to the which also ye are called in one body and be ye thankful let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And whatsoever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by Him. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands, as it is fit in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives, and be not bitter against them. Children, obey your parents in all things, for this is well-pleasing unto the Lord. Fathers, provoke not your children to anger, lest they be discouraged. Let's pray, and then we'll continue. Dear Father, I thank You for Your Word. And Lord, I thank You for the opportunity that You've given to us tonight to open it and to learn from it. And I do pray that You would help us to learn what we need to learn individually. Lord, I pray especially that You would help me to say what I should tonight and not to say anything that I shouldn't. Lord, help us to receive your message. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Amen. <clears throat> there are several ingredients that constitute a Christian home. And we are not going to exhaust all of them tonight. But we will go over a few of them. The first one is is talked about in verse number 15 and it is peace. The peace of God will rule in the hearts of the people in a Christian home. There won't be fighting and screaming or constant friction in a Christian home. Instead, it will be a refuge to come from the battleground, not to it. It's a place of sweet fellowship, fortified against the devil. Peace is something that is valuable, but something you cannot put a dollar figure on the value of it. Yeah. Peace is something that you cannot buy. Mm. There's no store that sells it. No amount of money can buy it. There have been millions who have tried to purchase it, with money, by giving gifts or giving straight money. But it doesn't work that way. Peace is an attribute that you find in a Christian and in a Christian home. <clears throat> All Christians don't have peace. They have peace with God, but many times don't have peace of God. And if they don't have peace of God, they cannot have peace of God in their home. Having peace with God simply means I've accepted Jesus as my personal Savior and He is my Lord and Savior. Amen. That's having peace with God. Having peace of God is when we are following His commands and He gives us that peace. That is why there are Christians who in their homes do not have peace. 
because God hasn't given them that peace. And the reason is because they haven't chosen to obey Him in all things. Not saying that they're perfect, because no person is perfect. I certainly ain't perfect. I mess up daily. Many times hourly. Many times even several times in an hour. Okay? But I want to do what's right. That's my aspiration of life. I want to be pleasing to God. He certainly deserves it of me. And I like the benefits of it, such as peace. Amen. So in a Christian home, you're going to have peace. You're not going to have constant bickering, fighting, screaming, and arguing. Another thing that you're going to find is thankfulness. <clears throat> it's easy to gripe and complain because that's our nature. It's a sin nature. But if we obey God in this area, we will be thankful. By the way, I want to point out something to you right here. Because griping and complaining is our nature, we're going to default to that regularly unless we choose on purpose not to. We are not naturally thankful people. It doesn't come that way. That's not in the sin nature. It's in our new nature. But even then we have to draw it out on purpose. Therefore, if we're going to be a thankful person, we have to do it on purpose. Amen. <clears throat> we have many things to complain about. Sometimes I'll ask somebody, how are you doing? Well, can't complain. You're lying. <laughs> we can. We can. Every one of us could get up here and complain about 12 things right now if we wanted to. Right? I mean, honest, true things that we are dealing with in our life. But we can also get up here and mention 25 or 30 or 50 or 100 things that we're thankful for. Right? Every one of us. So it's our choice to choose to be thankful or to choose to gripe and complain. I think I read the story um, some time back about a, an older man who was put into a nursing home. I don't know if you remember or not. But he was nearly blind, could not see, and when the lady took him into the room, he said, I love it. She said, well, you haven't even had a chance to really find out about the room. You can't see it. He says, hey, I choose to love it. I can choose to enjoy my blessings or I can choose to complain. Yeah. I can choose to complain about the body parts of mine that don't work or I can thank God for the ones that do. Yeah. So it's a choice. And if we're going to be thankful as Christians and have a Christian home, we're going to be thankful on purpose. It's not going to come on accident. It's easy many times, and this, this kind of struck me when Brother Tommy mentioned when Corey comes, Cody comes home sometimes, he asks him, so what would you do today? <clears throat> it's easy for us when we walk in the door after a long, hard day to voice our complaint, Right? And I don't know that Cody does this. He probably walks in with a big smile on his face and he's thankful for being in the police academy, I'm sure, and loves his uh, instructors and all that sort of thing. But anyway, I, I just know this. <clears throat> it's our nature to walk in the door and just fall down and, oh, it was terrible today. I'll tell you what, I hope I never have to deal with that person again. And just complain about the thing. But we have things to be thankful for. Amen. And it's simply our choice on which one we're going to magnify. In a Christian home, you're going to find that they're thankful, not complainers. If you want to do a word search in the Bible, look up complaining, complainers, complain, murmur, murmurers, murmuring, murmurings. Look up those words and you'll find several places in the Bible where God hates yeah. that. You know why? Because when we complain, we show that we don't trust God. Mm -hmm. 
In other words, God made a mistake here. That's why He hates it. Because He doesn't make mistakes. Amen. <clears throat> In a Christian home, people don't gripe about what they have to eat. They thank God that they have something to eat. They don't gripe or complain about one family member or another. They just thank God that they are still alive, living under the same roof, and enjoying one another's company. Sometimes you don't know what you have until you lose it. In the Christian home, you'll find the use of God's Word actively and regularly. Look in verse 16. Let the Word of Christ dwell in you richly. In other words, it's bubbling up in you. It's flowing over the edge. Okay? <clears throat> Take time to have family devotions. Not just your personal devotion, but family devotions. Jeanette and I were traveling one time and we went up to we went to Connecticut for a wedding. My goodness, why couldn't they get married in Florida? But they got married in Connecticut, and we went up there, and on the way back, we stopped and stayed with uh, Tim Rabin, Tim Sharon Rabin. Some of you know them. And he told me that evening, he said, Brother Bruce, now in our home, right before we go to bed, we we have family devotion, we pray, and we... We sing a song and we share a blessing. And if y'all want to join us, you can. You don't have to, but that's what we do. And I said, sure, we'll do that. And we did. And the next day we were traveling home and the Holy Spirit hit me upside the head and said, why aren't you doing family devotions with your family? And I said, I don't know why I'm not, but I'm going to. And we started having family devotions. And I'm thankful that we did. It's not an easy thing to start because, again, it is not in our nature. It really isn't. And so we started doing that, and, and we have. every. Uh, we don't do that on Sunday nights or Wednesday nights because we, we go to church and we hear God's Word preached and we sing. And, but every other night of the week we do and have ever since then. And I think Justin and Sarah were... About that big then. <clears throat> but we need to have family devotions. I mean, it's not like we have to have a 45-minute dissertation of the Scripture, but we can at least share a blessing and maybe mention what nugget you got out of your Bible study that morning. And, and, and if you want to sing a song, that's even better. And then pray together. Families that pray together stay together. I'm sure you've heard that cliche, but there's some power in it. Yeah. <clears throat> Another thing that you're going to find in a Christian home is Christ honoring music. Notice what he said in, in verse 16. He said, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. <clears throat> now, I'm not saying that every music other than Christian music is bad. I'm not saying that. There is some classical music out there that's fine. And there's probably some others that are okay. Now, there are some music, even without the lyrics, that is not okay. Right. Okay? I'm studying a little bit on that right now. And Lord willing, in the near future, we're going to talk about some of that. Music is a hot button for many people, and especially Christians. Mm. The reason for that is because Satan uses it so well. Yeah. And we don't, we as Christians, and I say we, talking about all Christians across the face of the earth, if we're not singing proper music that is glorifying to God or listening to the right kind, then it rubs us raw when we talk about it. Yeah. That's why it's a hot button. But in this verse, 
he kind of lays it out here and says, you need to sing psalms and spiritual songs. Songs that are sung to the Lord. Now, there are some songs that may be fine, okay, and neutral if you want to call it that, but you're not going to sing that song to the Lord. Songs that are sung to the Lord are songs that exalt Him. Songs that glorify Him. Those are the kind of songs and singing and music that you're going to find in a Christian home. Not the kind that makes people angry, that gets people riled up, that gets your neighbors upset because of the volume. <clears throat> so in a Christian home, you're going to find Christian music. Music that draws us closer to Jesus, not pushes us away from Him. Amen. <clears throat> now also in a Christian home, wives are going to be submissive to their husbands according to verse 18 where it says, Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands. <clears throat> and husbands will give them good reason to be submissive to them because they are following their leader, which is Jesus. It's difficult for a woman to submit to her husband when he chooses not to submit to his authority. <clears throat> You'll also find obedient children in a Christian home. But that doesn't happen accidentally. Christian parents train their children to love God, not just to go to church. The word train means to develop or form the habits thoughts or behavior of a child by discipline and instruction to make proficient by instruction and practice. How many of you have heard or seen or watched someone train a dog? So if you throw the bone and tell him to go fetch it, what you're expecting him to do is go running over there and skidding across the ground, grab it with his mouth and run back to you, wagging his tail and hold it up to you, right? So if you throw him the bone out there and he runs out there and looks at it and then runs back to you and leaves it over there, you haven't trained him. Right? Right. So you go over there and you pick up the bone and you throw it again and you this time you got a little tree and so he runs over there and he gets the bone and he brings it to you you give him a treat he feels rewarded you do it again and he, he and and it works fine every time until you've gotten the dog to do what you wanted him to do you haven't trained the dog right right it's the same way with people you can tell your child, come here. Now, three, two, one. I hate that. I hate to hear, I hate to hear people do that. I, mean, I guess if it works for them, that's fine, but it's what you're doing is you're teaching them that they have time to wait to right. determine whether or not they're going to obey you or not. Right. If I have to get up, I don't know what I'm going to do, but if I have to get up, and, and so we don't train the child. You, you get where I'm coming from? In a Christian home, the Christians train their children. And there's a reason for that. <clears throat> Solomon said that parents who love their children will discipline them with the rod in Proverbs 13.24. In fact, they recognize that it must be started early because there may come a time when it will not be productive, right. according to Proverbs 
Most of all, Christian parents have learned in Proverbs 23, verse 13 and 14, that biblical discipline will save their soul from hell. It's not that I'm disciplining my child because it's more peaceful in the home, although it is. It's not that I'm disciplining them because they're making me aggravated, although they may. It's not that I'm disciplining them so that they don't embarrass me when I'm in public, even though that does happen. (laughs) We are disciplining them because we want to save their soul from hell. And we want to teach them godly love. And godly love has that side to it. Amen. Because I love my son and my daughter, and Jeanette and I both love them, we had to whip them. We had to discipline them. We had to take away from thing, things from them so that they understood they messed up. Yeah. Why? Because one day they were going to learn about God They needed to know that God does the same thing and they needed to have a fear of God just like the fear that that we instilled in them of us. You know, children don't know God. Mm. In fact, what they know about God, they learn most of the time from their father. Mm. And how he acts and how he disciplines How he loves is how they picture God. That's why it's important in a Christian home that a father walk a straight line and that he does everything according to what God said so that one day he could lead his children to a right relationship with God when it's time. In a Christian home, fathers don't provoke their children to wrath through hypocrisies and high spiritual demands of which they cannot meet. Instead, they nurture or train them into a close walk with God by their own example, played out through daily activities, according to Ephesians 6.4. A Christian father is much more than the breadwinner of the family. He is the provider. Provider of what? He provides all things, not just money. He provides spiritual training on their level. He provides spiritual protection from the attacks of the enemy. His, he provides His time with them. He provides stability in the home. He provides love and attention. He provides direction. By the way, it is not the Father's responsibility to provide money, food, or clothing for His family, according to Matthew 6.33. God said, I'll take care of that. He said, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about the bill. Don't worry about your food. Don't worry about the roof over your head. I'll take care of that. You seek me first. So if it's not, and, and I'm saying that, I'm emphasizing that because most of us men think that that is our primary job to provide money, a roof over the head, education, clothing, food, and that sort of thing, and it's not. Now, are we supposed to provide those things? We are supposed to provide those things as God provides them to us. But He gives them to us first. We don't generate them. We don't make them. He gives it to us. The job that we have, that we go to, and we earn the money to buy the things that we wear and the things that we eat, 
God gave us that job. He gave us the ability to do those things. In a Christian home, that's the kind of father you're going to find. So my question to you is this. Is your home a Christian home? I'll be honest with you. There's some things that I look through in this and I feel that I'm falling short in. The truth is, like I said in the beginning, this is not exhaustive of all the things that you're going to find in a Christian home. It's, it's, it's just the tip of the iceberg. But what you will find in a Christian home, you'll find right here. Amen. The principles to live by, the commands to follow, are right here. And when we do, we will have a Christian home. Let's pray. Father, I thank You for loving us. And Lord, I do appreciate the direction that You have shown to us in this passage tonight on how we can have a Christian home. Lord, I pray that You would help us to follow Your direction, to be obedient to the things that You've commanded us to do. Lord, help me to be the Christian husband, the Christian father and leader of my home that I ought to be so that we have a Christian home. Lord, I thank You for that. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Let's stand. Turn to page 489. Thank you.